Good afternoon and welcome to the OPPI Digital Knowledge Series in collaboration with IPA and IDMA. Wise men say the future belongs to those who learn more skills and combine them in creative ways. The future is not what it was. It is no longer the big beating the small. It's all about the fast beating the slow. The future of business is all about reinventing oneself and adapting and responding to the changing business dynamics. We live in a data driven world that requires digital dexterity and customer first innovation. It's all about a robust digital agenda and of course, prioritization of building digital capabilities within the organization. Easier said than done. So where do these organizations begin as they embark on this digital roller coaster ride? How will these capabilities and skill sets be created? Today's webinar attempts to throw light on some of these topics and looks to explore the opportunities as we as an industry aim to respond better and faster to the expectations of our patients. To set the context of today's webinar, may I invite Anandram Narsimhan, Managing Director, Merck Specialities Private Limited, to address us. Over to you, Anand. Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, a very, very warm welcome to you. Thank you, Bhavna. And it is my pleasure to welcome all of the participants who have registered, over 400 plus participants have registered for this OPPI Digital Knowledge Series. In fact, the timing is just right as lockdown is easing and different parts of the country. But today it's, it's quite a bit of a cliche when you mention the word digital, right? And the disruptive potential of digital. However, the question that one needs to ask is what does digital mean for me? And when you're looking at all this change that is happening outside, we need to think about what capabilities are needed so that I can participate in this entire digital transformation journey. And it all begins up here, creating a digital mindset, my friends. As organizations charter a digital agenda, there will be a lot of capabilities and skills that we will have to build. And this is driven by what's happening outside. Yes, today pharma has come into the center of a digital disrupted world. And there is a need to act. There will be skilling and reskilling of employees and talent within the organizations. And yes, we will need digital leaders within businesses. This will be very, very crucial as organizations look to unlock the value creating power of the most important workforce. So it's no longer digital for friends, for business, my friends. But it's digital for me, you and each one of us. The future will call for redefining the traditional roles. <clears throat> there will be a shift. And this digital shift will demand new organizational models. Two things will be needed. Agility and adaptability. And this is going to be de defining. Who's going to win and who's going to stay ahead of the race. And to embrace this shift, companies must reshape. Reboot. Yes, we will have to reboot ourselves now and reskill. Digital leadership is here to stay. A recent MIT CISR CIO digital disruption survey pointed out that digital leadership can result in 38% better customer engagement, seven times more innovation, three times, three X times greater profitability when compared with competitors. So like I said, it's no longer digital for business. It is digital for me. And today's webinar has some extremely interesting insights into this need for the skilling and reskilling to make each of us stay relevant in this dynamic and VUCA world of today. 
during the session, guys, we will have mobile polls. So do keep your mobile phones handy and watch out for those polls that come and for those URLs so that we need your participation during today's session. And without much delay, I would like to welcome the team from the Conferry Hay Group who will take us through this digital journey today. So fasten your seat belts. So before I welcome the experts, let me take a few moments to thank Mr. Rajiv Krishnan, Managing Director of the Conferry Hay Group. Rajiv has over 25 years of people at organizational consulting and services experience, as well as sales and marketing experience in Indian and multinational organizations. Rajiv's contribution has been invaluable. Thank you so much, Rajiv. Many of us in the pharmaceutical and healthcare industry are acquainted with Shelpa Genthila, senior client partner and head of life sciences and healthcare services markets for the India geography at Conferi Hay Group. For over two decades, she has partnered with multinational as well as Indian organizations in this industry to build their leadership teams. Thank you, Shilpa, for helping put together this extremely exciting webinar for us today. And next, I would like to introduce the moderator for this session, my esteemed colleague on the AOPPI Executive Committee, Ms. Ashwini Deshpande. She is the general manager of Bristol Myers Squibs in India. And she has recently taken on this role. She has over 14 years of experience in the pharmaceutical industry, spanning India, Asia, across diverse therapeutic areas, including immunology, virology, cardiovascular, diabetes, and oncology. Through all these roles, she has led always with extreme passion to provide strong strategic insight, operationalize complex work streams. Welcome, Ashwini. And now, let me welcome our presenters. Sharad Vishwanath, Senior Client Partner and APAC Regional Head of Transactions, m and and Digital Transformations Practice and the Advisory Practice. Sharad, with his varied experience, advises clients on issues that accompany organizational transformation, stemming from strategic business and digital shifts and complex global and in-country deals. He supports clients in digital transformation and HR technology strategy and implementation with a focus on operationalizing execution of the digital information transformation strategies through organization and the people lever. Welcome, Sharad. And last, Nishit Mohanty, who is a client partner in the Conferry Advisory Practice. Nishit helps organizations function more like tech companies and helps their people transform into digital leaders. He has advised several organizations and their organization design, leadership capabilities, and culture in the journey from analog to digital. Welcome, Nishit. And before I hand over to the presenters, I want to once again thank Ashwini, Sharath, and Nishit for leading this webinar today. Over to you as we click into this digital reality of transformation, guys. Get ready for an exciting journey today. Thank you. Thank you, Sovangan. Really appreciate that introduction and the warm introduction. It's a pleasure for uh, both I and uh, Nishit uh, with Ashwini to be presenting to the group today. Uh, a warm welcome to everybody and, and thank you for sparing time for the next hour as we go through um, this exi exciting um, you know, narrative. Um, we wanted to actually begin, both Nishit and I, um, helping uh, you basically understand what um, three elements would look like. Um, Nikita, if we could move to the agenda slide, please. Um, the focus uh, for a lot of our, um, our own clients and, and folks we deal with is around helping understand what digital actually means. It's a rather big word uh, and, and sometimes gets used um, in different ways and means different things to different people. So can, kind of helping unpack that slightly is, is probably the first port of call. Uh, then we want to move on and looking at some of the elements which would be important in understanding what, if you know what you want to do in digital transformation and you have, have clarity on that, what are the elements which would be required to build, as, as Anand very rightly put it, digital for in the masses, the, the democratization of digital, which is very, very important in today's day and age. And finally, kind of sharing bases these two frames a real client uh, success story where, where this is actually being done and how. So that kind of brings it to life. We will be, uh, as we, as I mentioned, uh, 
looping in with you to get audience reactions and inputs on on the participant reaction, specifically some of these elements. So be ready with your mobile phones. Um, it's an easy way to be able to participate, and that input will help us make this even more relevant as we go along. Right. Uh, so with that, if we can move to the next slide, Nikita. Uh, let's spend some time, and Nishad, I would I would love to for you to come in as well. Um, so essentially, Nikita, if we could move to the next slide, please. Uh, so if you look at digital uh, per se, uh, the the what would you look at when you look at digital? Um, and we will ask that question uh, fairly soon. But let's first focus on understanding what digital actually means. There are we did a research across about 400 organizations, um, you know, five different industry groups and 14 countries to kind of uh, unpack this. And essentially, it's not only about technology. It's not about uh, digital marketing. It's not only about digital commerce. It's actually a mix of about seven things which we which we actually researched. Out. So, for example, understanding how digital will impact customer journeys is important. Yes, it is about using technology for efficient operations, and that could be IoT, would be RPA, uh, would be using ERP and other technology systems, using Industry 4.0 and automation in the factories. All that is important. Using analytics for better decision, seeding innovation, <clears throat> using both digital as well as, as non-digital uh, protocols, but blend it together. Ensuring that you're using digital for driving better customer connects, understanding um, patient needs, understanding healthcare professional needs, you using that to now push the digital commerce, which we see it, it with e-pharmacies uh, gaining a lot more traction on that front. How would you take that forward? And also creating now new products, which could be hybrids or pure digital products for the digital age. And then finally, ensuring that you're building sustainability in the model to ensure you can keep innovating and keep leveraging digital for the future. It's actually, therefore, digital transformation is a combination of all these seven things, right? Because I know you have, you know, you've spoken to many management teams uh, in the life care, uh, life sciences sector, and there are some examples of which would be very interesting for our participants to hear. Absolutely. Uh what digital means to every industry and every person is different. But what is happening right now is that there are some uh, very immediate use cases that are emerging in the life sciences sector that many of our clients have, have, have spoken to us about. So let me give you a few examples of what has become very relevant in, in the last couple of months. Uh, the first element is search engine optimization or SEO. Uh, SEO means that when people are searching for something, how easily do you come up as their preferred answer or as their preferred choice? Uh, and for that, one of our clients wondered, what is it that, that, that the customers and people today are really thinking of or, or what are they searching for? And can you imagine that in today's date, the three things that they are searching for are number one, how do I boost my immunity? Number two, what are natural remedies for typical ailments that we have? And number three, whether the symptoms that I have require me to go and get a COVID test. So the point here is today more than ever, people are logging onto the internet and asking questions that in some way relate back to you. And if your organization and your team has not optimized what that search string leaves, then you are leaving a lot of opportunity on the table. This also brings us to this concept of e-pharmacies. Now, many years back, if you had to bank, you had to go to the bank. Uh, but today, if you have to buy medicines, you pretty much still have to go to a doctor and you still have to go to a pharmacy. Uh, we know that there are challenges today of e-pharmacies not being able to fulfill large orders or having large uh, longer wait times. But the question is at this stage, are you owning the real estate on the websites of these e-pharmacies? When people log on to the net meds and the one MGs of the world or even the Amazon Pharma section, do you are you even showing up in terms of your products and, and, and services? We talk about using data more effectively. Today, Amazon perhaps has a better view of the books that I will like than, than even me or my friends. But are we using that information about our customers and telling them what is it that they might need in the next six to nine months? 
today all of us know that we are unable to meet our, our mrs are unable to meet uh, the doctors uh, and what has become clear is that doctors don't even want to pick up uh, the mrs calls or or uh, you know attend zoom calls with with uh, with mrs uh, but that's on the one hand that is one mindset the other mindset is that doctors today more than ever need to know what is happening across the world what is the most latest up to date information around their areas of therapy is something that doctors today now need much more than ever because also know that a large number of of, of people in the community are not interacting with each other the way that they used to now what was the classical approach towards this the classical approach used to be very extensive long uh seminars and conferences they used to you you would fly down people from across the world uh, and you will host these day long two day long events at a at a huge fee uh, and you would get a little bit of value out of that today uh, sharad and i and shilpa were just on another webinar where there were some 50 people who had joined uh, we have more than 400 of you today uh, and similarly many of our clients are organizing learning events uh, webinars to connect with their with their doctor fraternity and help them at this time of need so please know that the challenge of digital at this time is not around how do i connect digitally or virtually with my doctor the challenge is how do i become relevant to my doctor at this time we've seen over the last uh, month or so what used to be the domain of csr right so you would have uh, telemedicine was really done for remote areas and typically in most organizations there's their csr department used to run that website and run that initiative um, uh, as well but over the last two months a large number of of uh, patients have adopted this this uh, platform as well as a large number of doctors now the, the technology always existed the need has been exacerbated today some of our clients are realizing that that platform is where you can house the data of medical records for patients you can house data for doctors and you can connect that to pharmacies so that the entire order taking order fulfillment process which by the way even now in most organizations is done on paper pencil all of that can be automated the way amazon automates uh, our uh, home delivery uh, process we're talking about work from home now I'm, I'm sure all of you will agree that each one of us was able to be effective and productive uh, in this work from home scenario. Uh, all of our holy cows of saying we have to be present in the offices got challenged uh, and we did have a dip of productivity, but we were able to manage. The point here is that those organizations were in the entire processes, be it a finance process or an HR process, uh, or a supply chain process, those processes that had a human element in the middle, those companies or those processes have not been able to be effectively done at work from home. Uh, if the process was entirely automated and seamless, it was a lot easier to do that. Many of you would have heard of situations where uh, one of your senior executives is, is complaining that he or she is using uh, the Airtel uh, a 4G dongle or, or a mobile as a hotspot and some of the SAP applications, the heavier ones are not loading up and he's unable to either create order fulfillment or, or approve certain things that need to be done on the system. So the point here is when it comes to corporate staff, a large amount, perhaps 90% of the work or even 95% of the work can be automated. Uh, we have to remove the human element from that process. Uh, it can be done very easily. You don't need to boil the ocean and it needs to be done now. Some of our clients where um, uh, a large part of automation had, was already existing experienced less than 5% of dip in their productivity, which brings us back to the last point of factory level automation. Now, we do know that at, in the factory, if you're, if you're working with a factory machine, you can't typically work from home. However, uh, one of our clients, uh, their, their uh, factory is in, is in um, uh, the union territory uh, of Dadri and, and most of their senior level employees either came from Gujarat, which has a large number of cases, or from Maharashtra, which also has a large number of cases. 
and the local uh, uh, factory level staff there and even the city did not want people to come from outside um, uh, you know into their city because this city has very very few i think they had only 15 cases uh, till till a few weeks back so they actually were able to operate the entire factory with about 25% of the staff uh, and this happened because a lot of the factory level automation had 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 already been 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 uh, implemented before the lockdown was announced uh, they experienced about 20 to 25% dip in the month of march and almost 0% productivity dip in the month of april so bringing this back here, digital does not only mean Amazon and Flipkart. Digital can mean very different things to parts of your businesses. Uh, it, it can be as simple as owning some website space on, on an e-pharmacy and, and coming up on a, on a search engine to connecting and being relevant to the medical community today to connecting platforms that, that uh, we know different stakeholders use. Um, and of course, working from home, whether it is for corporate staff and for factory level staff. We do submit that not all of these are as easy. Some of these, like the first two, two or three, can be very easily done. Factory level automation is the one that takes the maximum amount of, of, of time to ensure uh, and to turn around. But a lot can be done right now as we speak. Great points, Nishit. And I think, uh, so what's important to understand what I'm hearing you say is, Fundamentally, first, we unpack and look at seven different areas in which digital will work in organization, um, from customer journeys to analytics to automation uh, to innovation to, uh, to e-commerce. What it also tells you that every single one of us, the point which I was making, is in some shape or form either impacting or ensuring that we are going down this digital journey path, which therefore puts uh, the owners on us and some in some cases pressure on us to therefore be fully digitally capable as well. Uh, there isn't this isn't the responsibility of one function or the CEO or the CIO or the CDO or the or 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 for that matter uh, just the head of a head of uh, digital marketing for example. It is uh, it is important for every single one of us. And the and the uh, MR example with healthcare professionals is a, is a classic example where we know the interaction with shift, right? So with that, let's kind of jump into into a uh, kind of audience poll. We want to hear from you. Um, if we can move to the next slide, uh, what uh, we're going to ask you to go to uh, menti.com. That's www.menti.com. Uh, you just have to enter the code there, which is 798294. I will repeat, you have to all pull out your mobiles and go to menti.com and you have to enter the code 798294. And there you will see a set of questions. You have to, we have listed these seven areas out, which we just spoke of. You got to pick the top three, which you think are, uh, are priorities in your organization. And then as a next poll, we'll go to the, to the most important one. I'll repeat again, you all have to pull out your phones and go to www.menti.com. Enter the code 79-82-94. There we go. So we are real time seeing results emerging. From your poll. Should you just want to talk through this as the polls is coming up? Yeah. You know, uh, classically uh, in in our industry, we have perhaps been laggards when it comes to digital. Uh, I think a lot, a large part of um, digital was really automation, and a lot of automation was really uh, US FDA, uh, uh, you know, directed. So. So that we don't get our four four eight three letters, we 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 try to ensure that the entire process is well documented and automated, and it really served us well in in uh, you know at the at the R and D and and manufacturing sites. Uh, but today's context is is not really led by US FDA. It is led by our customers uh, wanting to engage with us differently, uh, and therefore we are finding that it's not about programmatically driving innovation or, or e-commerce e as much as the fact that we have to reimagine the entire customer journey. Uh, 
Yeah. Uh, today, everything that a patient does is on paper and he or she goes to different people um, who don't talk to each other and there is no central record or history or future or insight around what is really happening. Um, and this entire process is entirely disjointed. Today you call up uh, a bank and the bank knows you and knows what are the five last things that you did and knows how important uh, your, your time is and what you're likely asking for. Uh, but when you walk into a pharmacy today or uh, when you walk into most hospitals, they don't even know who you are. I think that's a that's a great call out. And I think what you're seeing um, on. So first of all, you are all very clearly understanding and seeing that there are seven facets to this problem, right? And, and how you unpack it. But what you're also seeing very clearly is if you look at focus on customer, looking at uh, digital technologies for, for efficient operations and then using data analytics. These are clearly emerging as big focus areas in the organizations you're a part of. And that's actually quite in line with what we are seeing as well. Some aspects which we are seeing more trend lines on emerge is actually on innovation because innovation is so key, especially for the life sciences sector. And, and folks are looking at using the same DNA and thinking to imbibe into how they drive innovation uh, in, in looking at molecules, looking at new new delivery systems, uh, but always anchored with what's happening with, with customers, uh, your patients, the healthcare professionals, and all the intermediaries you deal with, right? Now, why is this, is this important? Uh, because this actually ends up defining the focus of where our, uh, where the organization and the capability has to evolve. So imagine this is the reality. To implement this, uh, fundamentally speaking, you will have to focus on building a set of capabilities and it has to be uniform in some levels and then more heightened in others. What's important to understand is that capability development is not about learning alone. It's about two or three things. It's about ensuring that you are shifting the way you think. It's ensuring that you're applying what you're doing in real time and actually speaking, ensuring that you have the confidence to operate in the digital space with, with the right set of stakeholders so that you have enough knowledge. So literacy, which is what a lot of focus uh, folks focus on, is not enough. And we'll, we'll come to that as the as the next piece. Uh, Nikita, if we could actually move, uh, we can skip the next mentee in the interest of time. Let's move uh, to the next frame itself. So um, as we look at uh, the audience poll and we clearly saw that the, the focus was on customer and, and efficient operations and analytics, these are new skills, right? These are new important aspects to, to look at. Therefore, our clear hypothesis, having spoken to more than, I think, 100 management teams in the past two months and, and in the past few years, and all our research is telling you that this time is actually both an opportunity and an imperative for all employees to reinvent and reskill themselves. We are continuously hearing that what I thought I had two years for, I actually have nine months for. What I thought I had 12 months for to execute on the digital agenda, I actually have three to six months for, right? And that applies because that pressure is actually growing and it's coming from the customer side, which you all called out as being critical, or it's coming from the operations and efficiency side, which again, you called out to be critical. These issues are here and now. And that's important to understand that every single one of us will have a role to play. And if we don't step up at this point of time and look to proactively reinvent and reskill ourselves, then we are missing an opportunity. And in certain case, risking uh, us from getting uh, obsolete in let's say a two year scenario, which may, which may be very real in the, in the current context. Next slide, Nikita. Right. So now, having understood that, you may ask from an organization perspective and, and, and a personal perspective, how do I approach this? So this is another simple way of looking at it. We had research saying what categories of talent are required, especially in the life sciences sector from a future perspective, right? And current state, because remember, it's 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 a it's an amalgamation of both. You will not suddenly become a fully uh, technology company. You will you will still be core and, and true to the mission you are driving in terms of patient care and, and innovation and, and better health uh, for all. That therefore brings us to five areas. There is future talent, which we believe will be a digital native joining the workforce now or are, have already reinvented themselves. There's known critical talent and sales and R&D are classical examples in the life sciences world. 
which are highly specialized and would need very targeted digital upskilling, not only a baseline, but very targeted digital upskilling as well. Then there is new critical talent, which we know we need new skills for, which could be hybrid between, let's say, aspects around um, you know, deep technical life sciences and digital aspects. And I was, we were talking about this with, with an R&D head of a, of a pharma firm, which said that today, uh, as much as I need my biochemists and biotechnologies and chemists, I also need smart data analytics because my modeling is equally important as compared to discovering uh, you know, new molecules the way I'm doing, going about it. So both are actually working together, and that's a new critical skill as well, which you would need to look at. And then there is the base and the fundamental which of the engine, which is the high volume, um, uh, typical, but typical um, resources which we need, be it in supply chain, enabling functions, support staff, and the core prof professionals, which we also need to run. So this is not about picking spots or creating silos. It is actually about understanding that all of these five segments are going to be critical to play, but who plays what role and to what degree on, on the digital skilling side will vary, number one. And number two, Every single segment has to have a baseline level of digital enablement and scaling which they need or reskilling in certain cases when it's required. I'll give you a small example, and this comes from the tech space. But for example, in, in, in Amazon, they're actually taking, they're redeploying folks uh, from one function and actually training them over a three to six month program, which we are partnering with them on to build cloud engineers and, and data analysts. Uh, and it's being redeployed from one function to a completely new function on tech, right? If that can be done, absolutely. So can we in life sciences. Look at how we have moved in life sciences to a more digital world of interacting with our healthcare professionals. Continued factory production is 25% at 25% capacity, which Nish talked about. So absolutely, this use case has been proven within life science and out science, and we not need to focus on taking this forward. Next slide, please. Right. So we want to go back to you um, and, and sorry, uh, on the mindset. We, we want to go back to you and, and kind of share, therefore, the frame of what will result in building this capability, right? Nishit, I know you have uh, kind of looked at this um, uh, pretty, pretty closely, especially coming from a mindset and confidence perspective. You want to walk us through the frame and, and then yeah. and we, we kind of bring in some examples here? Yeah, whenever we talk about uh, digital skills, we, uh, you know, the, the frame that we always think of is uh, what do I need to learn? So do I need to learn how to in have an engaging conversation with a medical professional? Do I need to learn how I create culture within the organization when people are not coming to the office? Right. So if all of us really think about skills that we need to learn or, or, or uh, techniques that we need to learn and, and essentially um, you know, everything from knowing how to set up a Zoom call uh, and, and managing it effectively to uh, how do you build culture in a, in a remote uh, organization. All of this essentially has elements of skills. Uh, the good news here is that these skills uh, we have already adopted in our personal lives. Um, this is how we engage with technology in our personal lives. It's easy for us to, to translate that to our, our uh, professional lives and whether it is HBR or it is it is any other um, uh, you know source of your literature that you have today, there is a lot of uh, insight around what skills do we need today um, uh, to become more digitally conversant with our employees, with our customers, with our talent, with our stakeholders, and what have you. Uh, digital literacy, however, is just the the baseline element of what we need. On top of that is this element that we call digital confidence. Now, digital confidence needs a lot more. It needs you to be able to try something new and feel confident in being able to, to do it. So for example, uh, can you run three experiments on, on using data more effectively, uh, whether it is data for your employees or for your customers or for your, for your drugs, can you try three experiments that give you a different result and table those results over the next two weeks or so in front of your uh, leadership team? Can you create two or three hypotheses on what new talent models that you will need or engagement models that you will need and what your organization can start funding today uh, to become more relevant in the post COVID world? Now, all of this will not happen only if you are digitally literate. It will happen if you have the confidence to try something new, to, to take a little bit of risk 
and to demonstrate that something has happened. A right. note to organizations and leaders, you have to create an environment that is safe for people to try new things, that is safe for people to have a few um, uh, quote unquote failures, which is uh, making an experiment and not getting the result that you wanted. We, however, do know that we are a highly regulated uh, industry and therefore we can't break the rules. But within the rules, there is an infinite amount of thinking uh, and experimentation that we can do around all the seven areas uh, that we talked about to begin with. Which finally brings us to the most critical element, which is that of mindset. Now, the digital world is not the analog world done on computers. It is a fundamentally different world and that requires us to think differently in terms of our mindset. So element, so examples of mindset is we know that we will have many, many small bets that we'll make. Not all of them will succeed. In the analog world, we know the business model that works and we always try and drive results. But in the digital world, if, if we were think if you were a startup and if you were to think like a startup, a startup, 99% of the things that they do fail. So their, their, their DNA is essentially keep trying small, small things and, and, and seeing what works and building on that small success and then scaling it into a new business model. So our mindset is not to do what already exists. It is try something new, uh, go back to the drawing board and see what works on the ground and scale that further up. Sure. Well said, Nishit. And I think, um, you know, what's important to understand that if you are focusing as an individual, as a leader, or uh, and as, uh, as a CEO of a firm on these three aspects, uh, focusing on ensuring that, uh, that every single person gets the baseline on literacy, which is important, the foundation, but is able to build confidence and mindset. So I'll give you a couple of examples to bring this to life, right? So, um, we can share this with public, but for example, um, we we work with uh, Unilever globally a lot. Um, the core focus of Unilever in this time has been has become to ensure that they transform their sales using analytics. They were doing a small experiment in ensuring that they could run a, a specific analytics uh, model to tell for each Kirana store or store what should the <clears throat> SKUs be and what the structure should be. Each category used to have five sales reps go down to, to that particular store. They shifted that model because of the current realities into saying using that predictive model, they came back and said clearly what would be the SKU and the, and the distribution you would need for all those five categories. And only one person was both trained and then was going to that particular store owner. That shift was was done both on the base of helping them understand how to how to be how to use the analytics data and then educate the store owner, but also gave them confidence to say this is better for you rather than an individual taking a, taking a call on what should be stocked on your shelf. This is, will ensure that your ROI is maximum. Right? That included all three literacy included a shift in mindset for both the store owner as well as the sales rep, as well as the confidence for them say, don't worry, one person can do five people's job as effectively, which they are accelerating, right? Now that's a, uh, this is, they've already done that for a pilot and they're accelerating this to a second level. They, Levers also has a, a Unilever foundry, uh, which is essentially a crucible for newer ideas out, out of the, the regional office in Singapore. Uh, Nishit, you want to just talk very briefly about that as well? Yeah, so what better way to to think like a startup uh, than actually inviting startups to work within your organization? So Unilever uh, runs two such uh, speed boards as they call them. So they consider themselves as the big mothership like large organizations uh, that we have. And they have two small speed boards that they have deployed to drive agility uh, within the entire uh, uh, you know, uh, enterprise. So one of them is what they call the digital foundry. Now the foundry is essentially they have given real estate space. Uh, they have given uh, some workstations uh, and a, a simple entry criteria or a shortlisting criteria to startups who will work on their problem statements using the startup's own methodologies and data. Uh, and they will essentially uh, be funded. Uh, they will be guided and mentored. Uh, and the solutions that they create will be co-owned 
by both Unilever and the startups. And, and after that, they will be given a choice of either uh, of either um, uh, spinning off or getting absorbed by Unilever or, or creating a, a third alternative. Now, the startup, of course, loves this because they have access to data, a platform, leaders and, and what have and customers. Uh, and, and Unilever loves it because uh, they um, have all fresh thinking and, and new ideas that come out for their own problem statements. The second uh, speedboat that they have is something called Unilever International, where they have very small, very young uh, teams um, comprising people from very different walks of life. So none of them are MBAs, none of them are, are FMCG folks, but they're all people from digital companies, from design firms, and, and from all kinds of walks of life. And they look sound, uh, uh, you know, very different. And what they do is they, they take products of Unilever that have been uh, that are phased out from some some markets or that are very popular in other markets but have not been launched in their own market. They launch them in at breakneck speed, right? So they launch them in a, in a month's time where the mothership will probably take six months to do that. How do they do it? Uh, through agile teams, through uh, through agile ways of working and through a digital mindset. Now, no better way for an organization to start experimenting by actually working with the startup ecosystem, by actually working with talent from different walks of life uh, and helping their leaders to create this journey. Thanks, Mohan. Thanks, Nishit. Um, so if we could go back to the previous slide, uh, Nikita, let's now just get your feedback uh, and see if you were to pick, uh, again, go, go to www.menti.com the same code 7982.94. I repeat 7982.94. In case you come up with a question, which was the one before around the top area of digital transformation, just fill it and move to the next question, which will be this, because we skipped that question. So the question you're answering is share the top two digital capabilities that you need to develop most in the next six months. Uh, for your organization, for, for you, uh, what do you feel are the top two digital capabilities? And we will debrief on the back of this. Some very interesting insights come out <clears throat> from this research when we run this uh, with, with our clients. So again, go to www.menti.com on your mobile phones. Enter the code 798294. And Nikita will bring up the results on the back end. This is free form. But as we are going, I want to give a couple of examples <clears throat> uh, around, uh, you know, both the digital shift and mindset as well. Fundamentally speaking, we are, uh, and I'll give an example. Actually, uh, I think Anand would be familiar with, with, with it as well. If you look at uh, broadly life sciences, but especially in in in, in for Merck, uh, a lot of the commercial sales folks were known to be experts and deep experts in knowledge around reagents. Uh, what elements would we be using in? in terms of which which chemicals, processes, protocols. And we are increasingly finding, and, and Anand can comment on it as well, is that actually uh, Amazon is using uh, both knowledge management, data analytics, and AI to supplement that on one level to advise the same, same uh, customers you are going to who valued the deep expertise of the, of the commercial lead or the sales lead or the sales rep to replicate that through through digital and at the same time offer a much better seamless experience on delivery uh, using using their in their entire logistics uh, uh, strength. Now, if that was was is what's going on, imagine you are having disintermediation of your core expertise in the sales side. How do you ensure that you ensure that the person who's now interacting with your customer is able to step up and become an advisor? Same thing is happening with MRs and doctors today. A lot of the MRs will be able to share information digitally uh, and is available. A lot of the doctors, there was a previous webinar which OPPR led where the where a clear insight came out that healthcare professionals were interested in a hybrid protocol. They wanted to meet, uh, but maybe uh, also meet two times digitally. At the same time, they did want to get information on a real-time basis when they needed it. So if you can make that available on a, on a simple digital protocol, ensure that you meet them three times, but you meet them once uh, physically and twice through a digital medium, suddenly you have a very different customer engagement model. But that also ensures that it puts pressure on the capability for the sales and, and um, the sales function and, and the sales reps and leaders for, the, for that matter 
to be able to now act at a higher order advisory level because the baseline information is already available. You have trained them, uh, the HCP to, to use the information in a particular fashion. How do you upskill yourself? How do you reskill yourself? That's the pressure we are talking about when it comes to digital transformation. Right? So you see the results pouring in. Uh, a lot of us feel that uh, basic digital literacy around uh, engaging with our with our customers, uh, analytics, um, connecting with our talent and connecting with our customers is important. Interactions uh, with representatives is important. Uh, customer engagement is important. And, and by all means, I think 70% uh, of the challenge that you have will be around uh, creating literacy at scale. 20% uh, will probably be around creating confidence because we don't want all of us to start experimenting. Uh, but certainly at the leadership team and, and your uh, one downs, you will require a little bit of confidence to try new things. And the good news is everybody's trying new things. We don't know what's going to work. Uh, the only ones who will lose are the ones who are not trying. Uh, and finally, mindset. If you are a, a CXO within your organization, you need to think like a startup. You need to think like uh, if 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 Jeff Bezos, uh, uh, Jack Ma, and and Elon Musk were, were to get together and and disrupt our our industry, how will they think? That's the thinking. That's the mindset with which you need to operate today. Correct, and I think therefore this kind of brings us. Uh, sorry, were you making a comment, Nishan? No, I think. Love to hear so I, I think, from yeah. the groups. Yeah. So I think what we will uh, we will do is now uh, we are we want to be respectful of time. We are slightly over, but we want to ensure we will close uh, this with a, a live case where you we are facing a similar challenge. Uh, Nikita, if you could go to slide twelve, please, and then we'll go to slide fourteen directly. Uh, but to share with you, uh, essentially, what what uh, what was important is we had a situation actually interesting during COVID and pre-COVID where essentially a, 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 we had a, a life sciences client come to us and say that I'm, I'm, we are clearly feeling the degree of, of pressure in terms of shift which is required. So um, we have just been asked to accelerate some of the aspects around, uh, around digitization now. Um, there is immense pressure on the larger talent which we spoke of to be able to step up and start to engage with, <clears throat> with different parts of the organization and our customer groups in a more digital fashion. We have we want to have actually folks who are learning fairly quickly or, or do have the confidence uh, to be able to, to have this conversation as well as the mindset. And they said, but I need this for my entire population of 10,000 people in APAC. I need to ensure that I'm able to rapidly build and accelerate the shift at scale. And but the key point was they had tried running this uh, you know, I guess the digital shift campaign in a push mode, and they had had uh, did not have much success and a very limited success. In fact, the success was uh, were far beyond from what what was being expected by stakeholders and customers. So they said we need these five things to come up: a pull led, employee initiated, personalized, scalable, and a virtual and digitally enabled uh, solution. So it should be in a way which where every single individual understands what they need to build. They are doing enough to build uh, from a from a pull perspective and it's personalized so that it is something they feel is relevant to them and what's in it for them here and now. There were two aspects which we called out which are very critical to understand. One is there has to be an adequate uh, mix between learn and do. 50% learn, 50% do, which focuses on mindset and confidence. And the second is you have to ensure that you address the what's in it for them. So we applied uh, and worked with them on under using design thinking and what users actually want. So Nikita, if we could move to slide 14 directly, please. And what we did, 14, just before. Yeah, uh, what we actually did is we used, basically the idea was to solve for it, uh, to ensure that you build literacy, but you also address confidence and mindset. Because as you saw in the poll you just completed, most of the tilt, even from a personal and a leadership perspective, is around literacy. That's important, but actually that's not enough. And we see the, the success only comes from having the right mindset and confidence. So how do you build that? Now, if you put yourself in the heads of the user, the learner, which is what we did in this situation, 
across, and we ran we run pilots across different systems around sales, R and D, and HR. You actually do user listening to understanding where are they when it comes to their digital capability. Um, we've talked about specific personas for them. We built about twelve personas for different kinds of people in different functions because they learn differently, they think differently, their learning styles are different. And then on that basis, you design specific learning journeys which were very, very personalized and curated for them because that creates a pull factor, right? And then it was loaded onto a, on a digital platform which is gamified, very slick with UI, very similar to what you would end up using uh, if, if you are if you're using Facebook or a very very intuitive as well right and it was anchored in ensuring that you measured specific outcomes so for example let me sh uh, share with you what a journey would look like for um, for the senior leaders we were working with be on sales um, uh, sales HR or, or supply chain and remember this was being built for senior leaders middle level leaders as well as entry level uh, resources so it was pretty uniform but being done at a different level which is personalized for example in the senior senior leader uh, perspective some of the do elements was actually working with a set of startups outside similar to what we were talking about in levers uh, and and ensuring that you actually end up uh, launching an initiative internally within uh, within the client to get to a particular outcome it could be on better customer journeys or better efficiency on cost or, or ensuring that you are doing better in terms of outcomes from a from a, a client satisfaction yeah. perspective. And finally, we put together a reverse mentoring and a peer learning um, anchor so that they were able to get to a particular outcome. So the, the focus was on, yes, on learning about data science. They went through a course on that. Yes, on AI and the workforce of, of the future 2.0, they went through an online webinar. Yes, learning from an external conversation with the CEO and HR of a startup company to get that perspective. That was a learn part, but there was an equal and important faction of do. And in the peer learning, they were teaching, building digital confidence and reverse mentoring. They were actually getting uh, coached by someone who was junior or someone who could be more digitally sophisticated, building that confidence to learn and know that I had gaps. So that's how you kind of solve for, for in, in an actual real world setting at a scalable solution, which a lot of, of, of you would must be wondering as well. I can see Ashwini uh, receiving a large number of questions and, and raring to go. So Ashwini, with that, uh, we'd love to hand over to you and uh, uh, ask a question, please. Thank you, Nishit and Sharath. This has been uh, a great uh, presentation and I do have tons of questions that have come in. Uh, so first, I'd like to start with uh, which of the three uh, is the hardest to build uh, when it comes to confidence, uh, digital confidence, when it comes to mindset and uh, when it comes to the third one, which was literacy. Yeah. So out of the three, which one is it? Yeah, that's a great question. And what we find is that uh, literacy is the easiest uh, uh, to learn because um, I mean, when I think back, I did not have to teach my mom how to use uh, Facebook or Uber or WhatsApp, right? Um, she, st she just learned it on her own um, and all of us um, can learn what it takes to succeed in, in, a, in a digital world. Um, that's not the hard part. Uh, creative confidence, on the other hand, requires two things. It requires a little bit of risk taking, uh, and it also requires an environment where you can try new things. Uh, and therefore, uh, for those of us who have low risk appetite uh, and who like to operate in environments that are more stable and repeatable, those are the uh, you know those uh, leaders will find it harder, uh, but we found a lot of for a lot of us even taking the first step, um, uh, you know, creates a huge difference. Finally, it comes to mindset. Mindset is uh, you know uh, uh, it can be as easy as flipping a switch. It can be as hard as you you know going on and on for for the rest of your your career and not or not shifting it. Uh, so we found that leaders who have more openness to new ideas, they have a aspiration to try new things and and to and to be relevant in the future. They are able to shift mindsets well. But but yeah, mindset is the hardest, uh, and it's not enough for only you to to develop your mindset. You need your entire peer group and your top team to also change their mindset. And um, you know, to give an example that will bring that alive, um, and I was talking about the the uh, MR example earlier. But if you look at the entire sales function, uh, teaching them a new platform skill or a way to look at analytics uh, for better predictive customer interaction is easy. 
uh, ensuring that you are able to move up uh, a level in terms of being able to become an advisor and not provide not a provider of information is the difficult part which comes from the confidence side you have to build that confidence and for 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 you as an individual as a mindset to know that can i create a degree of differentiation from competition by by knowing what my, my the healthcare professional may want to know or by providing information before they know it or giving them an ecosystem of tools which i can curate for them that is where the mindset comes from which is thinking ahead and that's important therefore mindset is more difficult to build you can react but can you be proactive can you create something from what you have to service and healthcare professional in a different fashion even though you're an mr that's where mindset comes up great thank you now uh, you talked about you know the entire team needs to be involved here because sometimes uh, when you think about uh, digitization or companies getting on to different work stream it, it's typically thought that the chief uh, digital officer uh, you know it should be involved so how do you ensure you know first of all who should be involved in the company or the leadership and and how do you ensure everybody has that mindset and the confidence level to do that great question ashwin i think very very uh, very pertinent question so uh, you know we have uh, done this research as i mentioned over foreign companies and we've spoken to more than 100 clients in the past 2 years one thing is clear this is an actually top of the house agenda from uh, uh, from who takes and sponsors it so be it a ceo chairman uh, country head but having said that it has to flow through every single function head and then fundamentally down to every team leader because if it does not cascade down and there isn't as i said a full led initiative which you are which you are putting uh, into place you will not see an actual shift happen so two things are critical sponsorship clarity and guide rails coming from the top and i and i mean the top team in, including uh, uh, the ceo or the chairman and then second is ensuring that every single team understands what's in it for them and relevant to them and being able to curate and create something which is relevant for what's helping them in the next 6 to 9 months this is not about moonshots alone it's not about became becoming the next digital upstart but it's about doing things differently and incrementally i you know i want to give a small example in in especially in life sciences uh, most folks will will not want to take risks given where the industry is and how it's been on let's say the outer periphery of of digital transformation but if you can say that i am actually looking at measuring the new versus your know, driving results ratio in, in terms of what you're doing but in small ways for example if you interact with someone up on a particular way can you change that if you are dealing with a customer in a in a in a particular fashion sharing this information can you use a different platform to do that can you take a different route to work so you are creating that small shift in mindset but that has to be led by by the top and i'll give a small example you know anand is in the call and he was saying we are trying to ensure that in today's day and age employees feel comfortable that they, that this is the long haul they can take a time a bit off or take a bit of time off and i'm going to take the lead from taking a, a day off uh, so that the right message is going to the right set of people that kind of leadership at the top is absolutely critical but it has to be led by specific people uh, at at the at the base end as well now uh, another interesting question since we did say in the beginning there's a you know a uh, big pool of marketing and sales professionals on this call uh, that the pharma selling model is based a lot on relationships and uh, you know interactions and the connect you have with the customer so what skills are required when you replace your face to face interaction with a digital uh, interaction then how do you still manage to have that personal relationship yeah so uh, this is a, a great question and i think to begin with if we if we uh, uh, look back uh, at our personal lives uh, all of us uh, i think have done zoom calls with family members that we would have otherwise not met uh, in this time uh, the reason for that is uh, we are we we feel that we need to take a a physical experience uh, or an experience in the real world and convert that into uh, a digital experience uh, but digital natives think very differently or digital first uh, companies and and individuals think differently because they they don't think of converting an analog experience into digital they reimagine that that experience uh, 
earlier we would have strategy meetings and and learning sessions for say one day two days three days right we would go to singapore and and, and you know um, uh, do a three day workshop today we don't need to have learning only for three days we can spread it out over a month this is fundamentally reimagining that experience similarly building a relationship need not necessarily need physical contact building a relationship however is not about connect only it is about relevance so the day we realize that our job is not to connect and 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 engage with our customers only it is to challenge it is to coach it is to be relevant it is to help them succeed at their job and remember they are struggling even more than you are their jobs are they are in the firing line they are more stressed and they are more uh, um, hindered by what they are doing so all i would say is ask yourself how can you be relevant to that human being today and if you are able to answer that question virtual no virtual we will we will still be more relevant and i think a build on that i think the reality quite honestly ashwini is that uh, will the <clears throat> physical interaction go away absolutely not it will be important in fact it'll, it could become even more important so if i were to make this very specific to, to the question which is being asked for example one how do you create more impact in the in the fewer instances you have on the physical interaction in in creating relevance and value the point which you should just made is the first skill which you'll have to skill yourself on to you don't have the luxury of five meetings anymore uh, with your healthcare professional right number two is there is a, an art and a science to being effective in in a virtual setting right how do you use time more effectively presence elements what do you convey what elements uh, are, are you going to count on more understanding what's more relevant and then sequencing it some of those elements now and you know we've all got those invites and memes and and links on facebook on how to be a more effective zoom presenter or on in zoom meetings uh, think of that but take, take that to the next level in time when you're trying to create an impact for someone who has limited time and would want to ensure that in the first 5 minutes they get what is relevant and then you build around it so on the digital side you would have to reskill yourself to be able to be more effective on a shorter time frame but be also able to regularly feed the right information as a build up to that digital interaction so that you are using that more effectively and on on the when you do physically meet it's got to be more about the personal connect so you have to rewire your thinking on this take one last question from the list that i have and then i'll turn it over for uh, closing remarks so um, one of the key questions and it's come up many times actually uh, right now is how do you measure your success then because this is so new for many of us right now uh, so how, what is the right way to track the return on investment you know what are the right metrics and how do you land on those prior to actually going out and starting the initiative I'll give a short answer before I hand over to you, Sharan. Uh, in the uh, tech startup world, um, they rejected the earlier con concept of uh, business case. So, business case used to be a five-year projection of revenues, and all sorts of mathematical magic used to be done to create a fictitious story that sounded very credible when you look at the numbers. Um, in the tech startup world, they said we don't want a business case; we want a use case. bring me one human being bring me one person who who demonstrates using your product or using your idea in a new way and what they started doing is they started video ca video capturing it right so suddenly you you're going from a business case to a use case it's a story that you're creating right so in this time the it's too soon for us to start looking at organization metrics and and you know kpis etc at this time what matters is are you seeing user stories or stories of success that are coming out from the experiments that you're doing if you do 10 experiments you will have two successes that is what is going to be important because as you go back into the rebound phase and reimagine phase it is these stories that you will need to take and say this is what happened therefore this is what we need to build and scale in the organization and i i think the build on that is as you rightly mentioned a lot of folks will focus on roi and there are ways to look at and that's actually very very fundamental uh, that you look at roi in in an outcome and a business impact perspective uh, uh, and and to that point to what nishit just said the i'll give you an actual example of of the the client i was speaking of 
um, you know, being a global uh, a global client, uh, they were looking at this uh, initiative in impact to see what outcome would they make. So simple aspects such as, can I get one partnership with a external partner to improve my analytics capability uh, for for one segment of healthcare professionals? That was being measured over six to nine months as the first use case of pilot. Aspect of saying how many folks are now actually having conversations on on with the technology and cross silos on specific digital initiatives that was being tracked uh, to ensure. Of course, how many people who are participating in a particular, um, you know, platform and learning uh, intervention, how they're applying it to, to their uh, typical outcomes measured through regular KPIs is already measured. But as but specific use cases to the point which, which Nishit talked about linked to business outcomes is what you need to start to measure to get to ROI. And it, it's not that challenging. For example, if you start to see uh, a much more positive feedback coming from healthcare professionals on the way you have now developed a digital interaction program, you start to see an uptick of, of, uh, of prescriptions and, and sales in that segment. That's the way you're measuring the effectiveness of your interaction as well. So there are ways to bake in KPIs over a six to nine month period, but fundamentally the way as you are going through this uh, through this development piece, there should be small milestones of the do element, which I talked about, which actually can be measured, which is linked to ROI and that's fundamental. Great, that's very helpful. So I got the green light to uh, ask more questions. So uh, I'm going to do that. Uh, one of the things that you know we looked we talked a lot about internal right so organization perspective uh, building capabilities inside but now when it comes to uh, some of the complex work streams we will have to choose digital partners so yes. what's the right way to make sure you have the right partner with you uh, with hopefully the same mindset so that you can drive innovation together i think go i ahead, short go short go ahead, yeah, yeah uh, go ahead there are uh, um, there are two parts uh, or two kinds of problem statements that you may have. Uh, one problem statement may be a technical challenge, which means it's been done before. It's a it's a no brainer. Uh, you know, it's essentially taking a best practice and and kind of just deploying it, plugging and playing it. When it comes to that, uh, choose a partner who's done it before and choose a partner that already has something that you can plug and play with. Do not reinvent the wheel. On the other hand, you'd also need to work with partners who are working today with you to reimagine the future. And that's not a technical challenge. It is an adaptive challenge. You don't know what you don't know. And there you need people who are, I mean, our, our recommendation is people who are excited and hungry to actually shape the future uh, as it comes along. And those are the partners that you that you need to work with today. Shara? Yeah, but I'll build on that with again with an example. One of the common areas, first of all, our clear recommendation to or to every client is you cannot be the best of all. You can't be the best analytics. The, focus on your core, but on the digital side, you have to build an ecosystem play to the extent that there should be one person in the structure, which we actually say should be leading ecosystem partnerships, because without that, you would never be able to scale and accelerate uh, as compared to especially competition. Number one. Number two, when you let's take the area of analytics, right? If you had uh, patient data and analytics or, or, or let's say sales data from a particular area and you want to have build predictive models around it, and if you believe that building internal capability will tell you take you six to eight months, well, our advice is you immediately try and look at, to Nishit's point, someone who has worked on a similar use case, maybe in pharma, maybe not, maybe in, in some other industry, let's say CPG, and put that partner in to say, can you help me build these predictive models? And again, these models always work in 1.0, 2.0, 3.0. So right, as you're building these models, you'll be able to build some degree of capability internally as well, and always keep that capability light. You don't want to build the best analytics team even if you wanted to, because a getting that talent uh, in is going to be difficult and more importantly, that's not your core focus. You want to be able to use that in a smart fashion with the right ecosystem. Same is for the digital stack or the technical stack you may be able to look at or RTA. So increasingly choose your partners, uh, which, were, which will allow you to your point, have alignment to how you're accelerating on the digital path and some of them will actually help you jump because you did not feel you had the capability, but bringing a partner in allowed you to get to a particular outcome, be it on, on cost save or, or a better customer outcome, or let's say the patient journey which you're redesigning. Great. 
Now, um, I think this is something, uh, you know, that's come up quite a bit. The, the next question, which is at, at this time, uh, our uh, healthcare professionals, the doctors have a lot on their plates and on their minds. So uh, when we are trying to reach out to them digitally, how do you make sure that, uh, you, you know, there's a balance? And so we want to hear from you. Uh, what's your advice on trying to innovate, trying to, you know, try this out when there's so many other companies trying to do the same, but at the same time, giving them the space that they need uh, to focus on patients and to get their practices back and things like that. Great, I think a very great question. And I think I would come back to what we had applied when we worked with a client, which is user-led thinking, user-led design thinking. I think the same hat is put on by our, by our sales professionals and, and put yourself in the shoes of, of the healthcare. But right now, what's front and center for them? If right now front and center them for them is to say, can I get back to, uh, to, to, uh, to revive or rebound from where I am currently? What are the elements I, as a person, can help them on in the current context, be it through a digital ecosystem where you're supplying information or be it an interaction where I can help solve a problem they have? That's what you want to focus on right now, right? And this need will evolve as your user's need evolves as well. So put on your, your user-centric design thinking hat and design thinking is a bit word, but simply put yourself in the shoes of the healthcare professional and see what is their need. I think the advisory needs in all the speak we have, uh, all the uh, research we have done is that the advisory need for our sales professional will need to go up. So that's an area you should be reskilling yourself while the tide is low, providing uh, information which is relevant to them in the current context. Six months down the line, when things are maybe back to normal in the healthcare sector to a certain extent, they may have different needs. Understand that and then support that through the digital ecosystem because they will prefer that. Uh, what is also important is optimality. So relevance and optimality of how much I want to share is driven by the user. If, and you can always test that. That's where the relationship element would come in. When you physically meet them, ask them what you've been doing is right or wrong. How would you want to shift it? How can I help you be more successful? And how can I help you make your life easy? That's where I think the element starts to shift. So just a small chip in here. Both my parents are doctors and uh, if they were not my parents, I'd realize uh, they are very difficult people to, to live with and to work with. Uh, I love them with, with the bottom of my heart. But uh, at this time, they are both scared. Uh, they are they are 68 and 74. Uh, they are both they are both scared uh, and they are both. Uh, they keep telling me that they are now for the first time very happy and proud that I did not become a doctor. Uh, so anything that that uh, people can do to help them allay their frustration, their scare, uh, and also tell them what other doctors are doing. Uh, yes, they are a tight-knit community, but they don't share information the, the way that they should. Uh, and therefore, all you need to do, I think, is, is be, be relevant and be empathetic to what they're going through. Great point. Great point. I yeah. would echo that much. I would completely echo that. You know, um, and by the way, this is universal. My, my both, Two of my uncles are doctors and my cousins in the UK and exactly same thing they're going through as well. There you go. That's very helpful. Yes. Uh, so one last question. Any advice on, you know, how does if you have, uh, you know, junior product managers or junior level people in the company excited about this and let, and yet your leadership is not there yet? Uh, how do you get mindset mind shift changes happening uh, upwards? That's a great question. And I, I must share that. This is true for any company, any industry, any anywhere, which is the junior folks tend to be the ones who have the sparkle in their eye. And it is our senior leaders mostly who have the biggest um, um, apprehension of, of, of being digital and thinking digital. So what what we have heard is um, uh, or uh, what you've seen work is, uh, is is stories. If If you can bring stories of things that are happening on the ground and tell them like a story, uh, not like a PowerPoint presentation, not like a, a business case analysis, but really an example of what's happening on the ground. And if you can come up with with something that is very easy for us to do, it, it make it a no brainer saying, oh my God, why aren't we doing more of this? Uh, concepts and ideas don't work because in theory, everything digital makes no sense. In theory, Uber does not make any sense. Airbnb does not make any sense. Wikipedia makes no sense. None of these make sense in theory, but the use cases 
make a lot of sense when you see it happen on the ground. I think the build on that would be quite honestly, Ashwin, that right now, if at all, this is the right time. I mean, uh, in, in all the conversation research we have done, the top most area where people, uh, all our leaders we've spoken to end up saying, I think we should do more on where we have missed the bus is on using digital in, in changing the way we work, right? And it's all almost the way we work. It's not about uh, digital and marketing or technology, the way we work. That understanding has percolated. So at this point of time, uh, the, if you create a bottom-up pressure, uh, which is linked to an outcome which the top team wants. So here, here is the balance and, and the question which got asked. If you were to say that a set of people who, who, are, who are eager to do this, uh, and there is a, a set of senior folks who are currently blockers. The current context has actually driven the, the guardrails away because of, of COVID. Everybody is ready and open to, to try and do things differently. But it has to be relevant again to what they are trying to drive in the next six to 12 months. So if it is around innovation, around sales, ensuring productivity, if we can, you can start to build capability to help on that front, then immediately you'll have more buy-in to say, okay, what? Let's and run a pilot. There's no big bang here run a pilot so two pieces of advice make it relevant to your top leadership group create the pressure from 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 inside and run a pilot if you tell stories run a pilot and be successful you start to create that that uh, viral change which, which we have seen before great thank you that's very very good advice so with that uh, i'll actually now turn it over to satya naren uh, from gladerma who will uh, give us the vote of thanks and close out the event for us Thank you. Thank you, Ashwini. This is the second webinar from Conferry team. Fantastic presentation in terms of content and engagement. Like our speakers emphasize, it's not about organizations doing digital. It's all about being digital. As a pharma industry, we have been late adopters of digital technology. Today, we have been able to harness digital and we continue to leverage this to ensure that we become increasingly efficient and we are able to focus our energies and efforts towards serving our patients faster and better. On behalf of OPPI, I'd like to thank Sharath and Nishit for a wonderful webinar. Thank you, Rajiv Krishna and Shilpa from Conferi A Group. The content, relevance and engagement in today's webinar has been outstanding. Thank you again. Thank you to my fellow colleagues, Anandaram Narsimhan and also Ashmi Deshpande for their participation and involvement in today's webinar. I would like to thank Sharad Tyagi, our president OPPI, and KG Anandakrishnan and DG OPPI for the knowledge series. Also, IPA Mr. Sudarshan Jain and also IDMA Mr. Dara Patel for your collaboration for making this industry, making this uh, pan-industry initiative. A big thank you to OPPI entire team, Prabha, Clara, and also our IT partner, Intel Gate, for the support. As they say, amazing things will happen when you begin to listen to the audience. And today our audience had amazing insight that made this webinar even more successful, more than 400 registrations. So thank you all for the attendees and we hope to have you back on our next webinar on June 9. And it promises to be a very interesting one. The topic uh, for the next webinar is the future of the field force in the new norm. So till we meet again, stay healthy, stay safe, stay safe. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.